You're listening to the Blood Bank Guy Essentials Podcast, episode 025. Right? So that's why it's an exponential equation. So when you do a one to one and a half plasma volume exchange, you remove 65 to 70% of whatever is in the plasma. That's the evil stuff and the good stuff, okay? It's 60, 65 to 70%. All those people that are residents, remember that for board exams, okay? Hey everyone, welcome to episode 25 of the Blood Bank Guy Essentials Podcast. This is Joe Chaffin, and I am, as always, your host. I really am excited that you're here today for the podcast. I have a really special guest for you today. It's Dr. Jeff Winters from the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. Uh, Jeff is an extraordinary expert on therapeutic apheresis. And for those of you that aren't real clear what that is, this is the, the right podcast for you. And for those of you that are, I think that you will learn a lot from this episode as well. Dr. Winters is the editor of the Journal of Clinical Apheresis, and he has a, a long and extensive background in therapeutic apheresis. I think therapeutic is a little bit, well, I don't know if it's poorly understood, uh, but I think it's under understood, if that's a word, I'm not sure it is actually, uh, among trainees in pathology as well as in people that practice transfusion medicine in hospital settings. So I really wanted to connect with Dr. Winters to to give you guys the opportunity to hear just the nuts and bolts, the essentials, what we're thinking about, what we're doing when we're doing therapeutic apheresis. Uh, This is actually a two-part podcast. This first episode, which if you're listening in real time, is the first episode of 2017, will just take you through the nuts and bolts and the basics of what it is is and what we're trying to do. And then with the next episode, uh, episode episode 26, we're going to talk through um, one specific type of therapeutic apheresis, and that is with thrombotic thrombocytopenic purpura. Well, I've made you wait long enough. I'm really excited for you to hear this. So without further ado, here's my interview with Dr. Jeff Winters. All right, everyone, welcome to the Blood Bank Guy Essentials podcast. My guest today is Dr. Jeff Winters from Mayo Clinic. Jeff, welcome to the podcast. Yeah, thanks for uh, inviting me. I'm looking forward to uh, chatting with you. It's going to be fun. There's no question about that. Yeah. So, well, I, I may be, yeah, it'll be fun for me. I hope it's fun for you. How about that? <laughs> oh, I think it'll be fun for the two of us. Uh, <laughs> okay. I have no doubt about that. <laughs> okay. Well, I want to let everyone know a little bit about you. Um, uh, Dr. Jeff Winters, everyone, uh, is a graduate of the Univers- University of Kentucky College of Medicine. Uh, he also trained at Kentucky for his anatomic and clinical pathology residency, and then did his transfusion medicine and blood bank fellowship at uh, the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. He's kind of done the uh, the shuttle back and forth between Kentucky and Mayo, it seems, Jeff, because you worked for a while in yep. Kentucky yep. after your after your fellowship. And and not, since 2001, uh, Jeff has been at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota um, in the Department of Laboratory Medicine and Pathology. He is currently a professor of laboratory medicine and pathology there at Mayo, and he's also the program director of the Mayo Clinic Transfusion Medicine Blood Banking Fellowship Program. And a lot of other titles, which, you yeah, know, don't worry about. Yeah. Them. <laughs> <laughs> in, in regards to what we're talking about today, he's he's the medical director of the Mayo Clinic Therapeutic Apheresis Treatment Unit, uh, which is a, a very busy, very busy service that performs a pro- about 3000 therapeutic apheresis procedures annually. And Jeff, since we're talking today about about therapeutic apheresis, I, I do want to mention that that you're a, a very active member of the American Society for Apheresis. And I, in fact, I believe in 2010, if I'm not wrong, you were the president of that society. Society. Is that correct? Yeah. yeah, I was. I just put a big plug in for people that are interested. Uh, ask for the American Society for Apheresis is a great organization. I would encourage people with an interest in apheresis to consider coming to a meeting, consider joining. Yeah. It's a real great uh, group of folks. That's uh, it, it. It is. I am. I am a member myself, and it's. Uh, it, it. I always learn from everything that gets put out from ASFA, including uh, the the journal which you are the editor in chief of, the Journal of yeah. Clinical Apheresis. So. Yeah. Um, Jeff, all that being said, as I mentioned, we're going to talk about therapeutic apheresis today. But before we get to that, I, I'm, I was hoping that you wouldn't mind just giving us a li- just a little bit of a thumbnail on what got you interested in, yeah. uh, in blood banking in general, and in, in particular, given your therapeutic apheresis interest in apheresis. Yeah. Well, you know, in medical school, uh, I really was interested in, in patient care. Um, mm-hmm. I, I, I did a post-sophomore fellowship uh, between second and third year medical school in the pathology department and uh, 
had basically functioned as a, an AP resident for a year. Uh, really enjoyed it. Ended up has, saying, this is what I want to do. But my plans were to do surgical pathology uh, fellowship uh, followed by pediatric pathology fellowship after doing APCP. Um, that was my plan. I got into <laughs> residency, and um, to be honest with you, I had a horrific black cloud when mm. I was on call. Uh, and to this day, I have a horrific black cloud. The <laughs> residents will t- say, you know, they, they don't necessarily like to be on when I'm on. It, the question is often asked, do I look for trouble or does trouble look for me? <laughs> but the bottom line is that as a resident, I'd get these phone calls and they would be like, hey, uh, Dr. Winters, um, uh, uh, we haven't seen one of these uh, in 10 years or we haven't seen one of these ever. Uh, and then these calls from the blood bank. And so it really was... Um, uh, very uh, intellectually challenging. Mm-hmm. Uh, a lot of really unique patients. Uh, a lot of really unique disease processes. Uh, and, and and where I felt that I really was making a difference with regard to patient care. Mm-hmm. And so it really piqued uh, my curiosity. This this blood banking piece of things. Um, I think the other thing that got me into transfusion medicine is I always really had enjoyed patient interactions and patient care. I know sometimes people say, oh, pathologists, you know, they all want to live in the basement with dead bodies. <laughs> but um, oh, wait, we know, don't. Oh, yeah, I'm confused. we don't. Um, but but I really enjoyed those interactions. And so transfusion medicine was the opportunity for me to continue to have those interactions with patients, both mm-hmm. uh, patients in the hospital uh, as well as blood donors. Yeah. Um, you asked how I got interested in apheresis. Uh, again, unique, different sorts of patients. And mm-hmm. again, the opportunity to do something that not many pathologists do, yeah. which is direct patient care. So mm-hmm. I get to go and examine patients. I get to go meet with patients. I get to go mm-hmm. talk to patients. I get to go talk with their families. I get to counsel them. Um, and I really derive a, a great deal of um, enjoyment and satisfaction from that. Yeah. So that's really what, what pulled me there. Plus, um, it's the weird and the wonderful um, <laughs> and the strange and the bizarre. Sure. And, 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 and that makes it interesting, makes life it does. interesting. Uh, I agree for sure. Well, so I, I want to I wanna take us into uh, apheresis because we've got a lot to talk about today. To, yeah. So folks, here's what we're going to do. Um, we're going we're gonna to cover the basics, the nuts and bolts of apheresis in general, therapeutic apheresis in particular, uh, therapeutic plasma exchange uh, specifically, and then close with a little bit of a discussion on the most common indication for therapeutic plasma exchange, uh, which is thrombotic thrombocytopenic purpura. We have a lot to, a lot to do and a lot to talk about. If this goes well, in other words, if I if Jeff ends this time saying, oh, well, that was OK, then hopefully I'll be able to convince him, break his arm a little bit to come back and talk about some other stuff like cytophoresis, for example, in the future. But for now, this is what we're going to do. So, Jeff, apheresis, let us yeah. talk about the nuts and bolts of apheresis. First, first, I mean, the easiest and most I, I don't know if it's the easiest, but the most obvious question is what the heck is it? When we say apheresis, what do we mean? Sure. I think first thing we need to do is you actually need to define the term. OK, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, and apheresis, it's derived from a Greek Greek word, which means to separate, to take away by force or to remove. And to be honest with you, that's what we're doing. We're taking blood, we're pumping it into a medical device, Mm -hmm. and we're separating the blood into its constituents, right? The cellular elements and the liquid component, the plasma. The cellular elements we can further subdivide, and we're either retaining one of those elements, maybe Mm -hmm. to transfuse into somebody else, maybe to throw away, Mm -hmm. maybe to run through another device to cleanse, and we're returning what we're not interested in uh, back to the patient Depending upon the procedure that we're doing, um, you know, obviously there there may be a need for a replacement fluid in order to maintain uh, the, the the patient's or the donor's uh, blood volume. So that's really what we're doing. We're we're um, we're you know people say removing the evil humors. Sometimes <laughs> people will say we're doing bloodletting. A bit more scientific than that, uh, <laughs> but in a sense, yes. So we're removing components of blood to treat underlying diseases. Okay, and and I'm uh, I think it's a, a safe assumption to say that that's not uh, as you mentioned. It's 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 more sophisticated than just yanking something out and throwing something else back in. Uh, specialized equipment, I'm assuming, is used. Correct. So there are cell separators out there um, that really we can divide into two broad categories, I would, I would argue. Uh, mm-hmm. One are the centrifugation-based devices. Mm-hmm. And so in those devices, blood gets pumped into essentially a centrifuge, which is going to separate the components based upon their density. 
Okay. Mm -hmm. um, so they're going to layer out. And if you can think of a centrifuge, if you think of it as, let's say, a spinning disc with a clear plastic belt around the outside of this thing, okay, the whole blood gets pumped into that belt. This disc is spinning around, and it layers out with the red cells being the farthest from the axis of rotation because they're the mm -hmm. most dense. The plasma being the closest to the axis of rotation because it's the least dense. And then the buffy coat okay. in between. If we focus in on that buffy coat, we're going to have platelets. They're going to be up next to the plasma. They're going to be sort of actually admixing a bit in the plasma. Then we're going to mm -hmm. have the lymphocytes and the monocytes. And then we're going to have the granulocytes. And they actually have a density that's pretty close to red blood cells. So they're going to admix down in that red cell layer. And then if you want to think in a very simplistic way, what we can do is essentially stick a straw in there into one of the layers that, that we're concerned about and draw that layer out and send mm -hmm. the rest of it back to the patient. So those are the centrifuge devices. The filtration-based devices, not so common in North America, Central America, very common in Europe, South America, predominant device in Asia. They base... They separate based on actually not the density, but the size of the element. So they're mm. going to have a filter, certain pore mm -hmm. size. Blood's going to go up against it. You know, let's say the plasma goes through. Uh, depending upon the pore size, you may retain things larger than albumin. You may retain things larger than uh, IgG. Mm -hmm. um, everything else goes through. And again, you can, you can do your separation there. Um, slightly different technologies. Okay, so uh, that that actually brings up a, a question. I, I do want to I, I want to cover this just a little bit in in brief, I'm not take too long. But obviously, you and I both practice here in here in the United States. People listen to this podcast all over the place. So, it, it, as best you can, can you just let us know a little bit? You already mentioned a little bit more filtration devices outside of the U.S. Are there mm -hmm. any other significant differences between U.S. based apheresis practice and uh, international? Yeah, the the biggest one, uh, which um makes me sad um, is <laughs> that um, the folks outside the U.S. Uh, actually have a fair number of uh, unique uh, devices and unique options that mm. uh, we do not have because the Food and Drug Administration has not approved them. There are a variety of columns that mm. are absorption columns where what will happen is using either a centrifugation or filtration device, we will separate the plasma, the liquid component of the blood, from the cellular elements. And then that plasma can be pumped through a column that will bind up um, something, uh, hmm. some evil humor, hmm. um, if you will. Uh, let's say an immunoglobulin. It may be all immunoglobulins, or it may be a specific autoantibody. It may be maybe the column contains a specific uh, epitope that an autoantibody hmm. is directed against. Um, so essentially cleanse the plasma, where then that cleansed plasma is returned to the patient. And so you don't require, actually, a replacement fluid in that setting. Unfortunately... Hmm. Other than columns used to remove LDL cholesterol and lipoprotein LA, which, again, would be a discussion for a podcast in the future, mm -hmm. um, we do not have access to those in the U.S., whereas in Europe, uh, they do, um, and in Canada, they do, um, and in, um, especially in, in Japan, where many of these have been developed. I see. Okay. So, Jeff, uh, as far as this process goes, who is responsible for doing it? In, I know, obviously, I've already mentioned in, in your context, in your setting, uh, you're responsible. You're, you're leading the charge for, for Mayo Clinic. But is that universal? Is it always the blood bank transfusion service? Not always. Um, so if you look at who bills the government, the U.S. government, mm -hmm. uh, for plasma exchanges, it, it, it gets it's broken down into about 40% of plasma exchanges are billed for by pathologists. 40% mm -hmm. are billed for by nephrologists. And then that remaining 20%, 10% are hematologists. And then the final 10%, is a mixed bag of immunologists, rheumatologists, um, oh. dermatologists, uh, <laughs> you name it, uh, neurologists. Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. there really is a, a, a wide variety of people who are practicing apheresis medicine uh, from a physician standpoint. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, to be honest with you, that's one of the things that makes um, apheresis interesting and also mm -hmm. makes the American Society for Apheresis interesting because there are lots of different people with different perspectives. And uh, I learned from from my colleagues from these other specialties. But by and large, it's 
half, if you want to think of it, it's it's nephrology and uh, pathology are uh, basically the the two major uh, specialties. So that actually that actually brings up a, a comparison that I wanted to make sure we made um, in terms of what the nephrologists generally do uh, the the dialysis procedure. What's the difference between dialysis and apheresis? They seem similar. Yeah. And that's an important key. Um, you know, a lot of times uh, in the past, uh, at times, uh, people will, will have a patient, let's say, with um, anti-basement membrane antibody syndrome, good pastures, right? Mm -hmm. And they'll have renal failure. They'll need dialysis. They'll need a plasma exchange to remove the antibody uh, causing the disease. And they'll say, well, they need both. Hey, isn't plasma exchange the same thing as dialysis? And they'll want to send it for one procedure. And they're not the same, okay? So, you know, if you think about dialysis, right, these procedures are similar in that, hey, blood is pumped into a complex medical device, right? And, mm -hmm. and, and things are separated from the blood, right? Mm -hmm. Both of them require some sort of anticoagulation to keep the blood from clotting in the device. Uh, both of them may require some sort of um, uh, central venous access or some sort of vascular access to get the blood out. How are they different? Well, in dialysis, you're going to have a membrane, right? Blood is on one side of this membrane, and then those substances that are being removed are diffusing through that membrane, following a concentration gradient, and going into a dialyzer fluid, right? Their flow rates uh, in dialysis uh, tend to be pretty high, about 800 mLs per minute. Um, mm. Now, if we think about apheresis again, um, at least in the U.S., predominantly centrifugation-based. So it's not requiring, uh, it's, it's, it's actually sort of bulk extraction, if you will, of plasma and not something right. following its concentration gradient across the membrane, okay? Um, flow rates uh, for centrifugation-based devices tend to max out at about 150 mLs per minute, okay? Implications there are that for dialysis, by and large, you need a central line, you need a fistula, you need something that's going to tolerate those flow rates. Whereas mm -hmm. with the slower flow rates with apheresis devices, uh, you can get by doing uh, peripheral access using peripheral veins, okay? Hmm. Dialysis, um, because it's a it tends to use heparin as the anticoagulant. So okay. you're going to see systemic anticoagulation in your patient, right? Mm. Whereas in apheresis, there's a tendency to use uh, citrate, specifically ACDA, uh, mm -hmm. as your anticoagulant. So you have what's referred to as regional or local anticoagulation. That is the blood within the apheresis device, but not the patient is anticoagulated. Mm -hmm. So there's some differences there with regard to, you know, care for the patients. You don't have mm -hmm. to worry about the, 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 the bleeding from systemic anticoagulation, but you do have to worry about hypocalcemic symptoms mm -hmm. because the citrate chelates calcium. I, I want to point out two other points that are really what I would consider also critical, right? You go. So, go for it. Um, one is during dialysis, right? If you have a patient who is undergoing dialysis, right? And let's say they're a little on the anemic side. You can turn mm -hmm. to your friendly nephrologist and you can say, hey, could you give them some red cells as part of the replacement fluid for the dialysis procedure? And the nephrologist is going to say, yeah, no problem. <laughs> no sweat. I get asked all the time, can you give some <clears throat> platelets? Can you give some red cells? Can you? And I'm like, no, I can't. I, I can't. Well, what do you mean? Dialysis does Well, okay, we're not dialysis. Again, <laughs> let's think back to what I said, right? That centrifuge where those blood layers are separating out and I'm sticking a straw down into the layer that I want. Uh -huh. In order to have an effective and efficient removal, I have to have a stable interface. What do I mean? I have to have a stable interface between those red blood cells and the Buffy coat and between the Buffy coat and the plasma. Now, uh -huh. if I'm given red cells and I'm changing the hematocrit, uh -huh. that red cell layer moves, right? Uh, it gets wider. Sure. And uh -huh. that Buffy coat shifts up. And so now maybe instead of my straw sucking out plasma, right, uh -huh. I'm uh -huh. sucking out platelet-rich plasma. Oops. Gotcha. Yep. Yep. <laughs> or I'm sucking yep. out the Buffy coat, right? Mm -hmm. Now, if we think back to dialysis, right, where I have a filter, where I have a membrane and I'm relying upon the diffusion of substances across that membrane, it really doesn't matter what I do on that other side of the membrane with regard to the hematocrit because the separation is not dependent upon the layering out of the cells. That so varying sense. the hematocrit means that things are great. So that's mm -hmm. one item. Okay. When you do apheresis, when you're doing plasma exchange, you can't be given red cells, you can't be given platelets, you can't be given plasma, which you can do when you're doing dialysis, right? The other thing is that when you do dialysis, frequently patients are coming in, they're volume overloaded, and you say to your nephrologist, hey, can you pull some extra water? Can you leave these people dry? 
Mm -hmm. And what they'll do is they'll increase the concentration of solute in their um, dialysis fluid, right, mm -hmm. their dialyzer. And what will happen is then water follows its concentration gradient across that membrane. And the proteins that are present in the plasma are concentrated, right? Right. Because you pulled all this free water, you pulled all this water out. Now all this water that's outside the vessel, it's in the third space, right? It's going to follow its concentration gradient. It's going to move from the extravascular space into the intravascular space because the proteins are concentrated, right? Mm -hmm. And that's the fluid shifts that we see at the end of dialysis. So we can pull extra water. We can leave somebody, quote, a liter dry, let's say, okay, when we do dialysis. Now, somebody comes to me and says, hey, leave this person a liter dry when you do the plasma exchange. Well, the problem there is I am removing plasma, and I am replacing it, usually with albumin, uh, which basically has the same oncotic pressures to it. So if I leave somebody a liter dry, it means basically I cut their replacement by a liter. It means I leave them hypovolemic by a liter. There's no driver to pull that fluid from the extravascular space into the intravascular space. There's mm -hmm. no concentrating of the proteins in the blood. Mm -hmm. uh, and so you see unacceptable hypotensive reactions in that setting. Mm -hmm. uh, I get asked all the time to do that. And I have some uh, astute clinicians that say, hey, Instead of using 3% albumin, why don't you use 25% albumin as your replacement? Because then you're going to concentrate the protein, right? And you'll draw that fluid out. Right. The problem is when I mix that 25% albumin with those red cells coming out of the centrifuge, uh, mm -hmm. those red cells really don't like that. And they're not happy. <laughs> they're not happy. Uh, so can't do that. So those are two, I think, other important differences that – inability to leave somebody uh, significantly volume depleted when you do a mm -hmm. plasma exchange versus dialysis and the inability to give uh, extraneous fluids, if you will, other than the replacement fluid where you're replacing uh, what you're removing with, with uh, something. Got it. That makes total sense. Well, why don't we, why don't we move on and talk a little bit about the, the, the main categories of, of therapeutic apheresis, uh, it, because we've, we've got to, we've got to move a little bit. So we've got yeah. to, we need to, to think about I'm the, -winded, you know, that's oh, no, 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 you're fine. This is awesome. It's, it's a podcast. We can kind of go as long as we want. So it's all cool. So, <laughs> talk to us, Jeff, a little bit, if you will, about the, the main categories of apheresis in terms of what we're taking out. Yeah. So, um, you know, pathologists, are all either lumpers or splitters, right? Mm -hmm. You know, they lump things together, they split things down. So lumping and splitting, we can take all apheresis procedures, we can lump them together into two broad categories. Okay. One is cytophoresis, I'm removing cells. Mm -hmm. And the other is plasmapheresis, I'm removing plasma, okay? Got it. Yeah, we can subdivide those two further. So if we think about the cytophoresis, if I am removing white cells, it's a leukocytophoresis. Okay. And some examples of that could be a therapeutic leukocytophoresis, when I'm, I'm treating, let's say, somebody with a, a acute myelogenous leukemia, their white mm -hmm. count's too high, I'm, I'm getting their blast count down. Mm -hmm. A stem cell collection, a granulocyte collection, uh, if we want to talk about some donor procedures, or mm -hmm. uh, something called photophoresis, which, again, is a podcast in and of itself, okay? Yes. Mm -hmm. If I'm removing platelets... Uh, I'm performing uh, a thrombocytophoresis if I'm doing it uh, therapeutically. That is, you know, somebody comes in, they have essential thrombosthenia, they have some myeloproliferative disorder, their platelets are too high, they've got a million platelet count, I can remove platelets. If mm -hmm. I'm doing a donation, I'm collecting platelets transfused to somebody, then we tend to call that uh, platelet phoresis. Okay. I can do an erythrocytophoresis, I can remove red cells. If I'm doing a donation, it tends to be, again, called erythrocytophoresis. If I'm removing mm -hmm. so many red cells that I have to replace them with red cells from the blood bank, then it's called a red cell exchange. So when we treat the complications of sickle cell anemia, when we treat uh, high levels of parasitemia in malaria or babesiosis, mm -hmm. that's what I'm doing there. Okay? Got it. Okay. Now, on the plasmapheresis side of things, right, um, plasmapheresis... In the term, just the term plasmapheresis, okay, means the removal of plasma, mm -hmm. uh, okay? We can subdivide that. We can have uh, plasma exchange where I remove the plasma, and I'm removing so much plasma, i got to replace it with some. Mm -hmm. That's a plasma exchange. Now, I want to point out to folks that plasmapheresis and plasma exchange actually are two separate terms. Mm -hmm. Why is this important? It's important for two reasons. One, if you go to Medline, you go to Grateful Med, you go to your favorite whatever to look up the literature, mm -hmm. they're actually two separate mesh headings. So if you do, you know, ingrown toenails and plasma exchange, okay, 
you're going to get a set of articles. If you do ingrown toenails and plasma freezes, you're going to get a separate set of articles. Okay. Okay. So for the listeners that are wanting to search on a disease and plasma exchange, my recommendation is you, whatever the disease is, and parentheses, plasma exchange or plasma freezes, close parentheses. Okay. So when you do searches, do it that way. Okay. Okay. Second issue is this. Unfortunately, we all live in the wonderful world of third-party payers, right? <laughs> yeah. And, um, you know, according to them, we, we're, we're doing plasma exchange, right? We're not mm-hmm. doing the, – the, the, in Europe, and again, there are these filtration devices that can do therapeutic plasmapheresis where you don't need a replacement fluid, but those mm-hmm. aren't available in the U.S. And so there are times that somebody in their clinical note says plasmapheresis performed for – and that reviewer reviewing the medical record for the insurance company sees it and says, oh, must have been an experimental procedure and they didn't get prior authorization. Wow. Wow. And so I know colleagues that have had pres- reimbursement denied. So I strongly encourage everybody listening to this that if it's a plasma exchange, please call it a plasma exchange. <laughs> call it a plasma it's, exchange. You make life easier, okay? <laughs> and if you're submitting to the Journal of Clinical Apheresis and you did a plasma exchange, Call it a plasma exchange, not plasma <laughs> freezes. That way the reviewers aren't going to come back to you and say, you got to change all this, okay? The editor has spoken. Okay. Um, <laughs> the other two things to briefly mention uh, under plasma freezes are immunoabsorption, which I had already alluded to. That mm-hmm. is separating the plasma, running it through the columns that bind up the immunoglobulins. Unfortunately, not available in the U.S., but available outside. Mm-hmm. And then LDL apheresis, now being called lipid apheresis, where, again, separating plasma, running it through a column that binds up LDL cholesterol and certain uh, pathogenic lipids. Uh, those devices, there are two that are available within the United States and about another four <laughs> that are available outside the United States and other countries. Got it. Okay, so Jeff, out of all those out of all those uh, procedures that you mentioned, in terms of uh, apheresis procedures, therapeutic apheresis procedures, which one is the most commonly done in the United that's, States? That's plasma exchange. So plasma mm-hmm. exchange, by far and away, um, is the most common procedure. If uh, from a therapeutic standpoint, uh, mm-hmm. just to give you the numbers here at Mayo, uh, you mentioned three thousand therapeutic procedures a year. Mm-hmm. Uh, of m- those 3,000 procedures, I do about 1,000 plasma exchanges. I do okay. about 1,000 stem cell collections. So those two are uh-huh. roughly equal in my practice. And then all the rest of those, um, the LD uh, lipid apheresis, mm-hmm. the red cell exchanges, the uh, platelet uh, f- uh, cytoreductions, all the rest of those, the photophoresis, mm-hmm. they make up that remaining 1,000. And Got some it. like uh, the white cell reductions and the platelet reductions are – in my practice, you know, 20, 30 a year. Okay. 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 So, um, you know, I, I was, I, as you were talking about all this, it seems, it seems really complicated, Jeff. It w- wouldn't, it would seem to me like it would just be really, really nice. It would mm-hmm. be really convenient and handy if, if perhaps some organization somewhere would, would put together something to kind of help us figure out what we're supposed to do with apheresis. Yeah, I don't know. You're throwing me a softball here. <laughs> it really is a softball, isn't it? Go for it. Yeah. T- t- okay. Tell me about how we do that. Hey, <laughs> this is something that I can't recommend strongly enough to folks out there, okay? Mm-hmm. So the American Society for Apheresis, uh, every three years, publishes guidelines on the use of of apheresis in clinical practice, okay? Mm -hmm. And these guidelines cover not only plasma exchange, but they also cover red cell exchange and the various cytoreductions and all the other procedures, okay? So these are published in the Journal of Clinical Apheresis. Like I said, every three years, the Mm -hmm. most recent ones were published in June, July of 2016, so they're hot off the presses. Right. The way this works is this. You know, we all want the gold standard in medicine, right? The Mm -hmm. randomized double-blinded, placebo-controlled mm-hmm. trial, mm-hmm. right? That's what we want. Sure. Unfortunately, in apheresis, eh, there aren't so many of those, okay? Mm-hmm. So what happens is there's a committee, about a dozen people, sit down, and they actually review uh, the world's literature on apheresis. Uh, each individual on that committee is assigned somewhere in the neighborhood of 7 to 10 to 12 uh, disease entities. They, mm-hmm. they review all the literature. They publish a one-page fact sheet. They write up a one-page fact sheet. It gets bounced to everybody. It's brutal. Let me tell you, it's just brutal. <laughs> People <laughs> review it. They make comments. It gets all marked up. Uh-huh. Then that uh, draft ends up going to the entire committee who tear it apart to. And then when that's all said and done, the entire committee comes down, and they, they, they assign some categories okay, mm-hmm. to the diseases. They assign categories and recommendation grades. Mm-hmm. 
Those categories recommendation grades and these one-page documents get published in these guidelines. Okay. Mm -hmm. So the one-page document includes what does the literature say? With number of patients, right. number of trials, case series, case reports. What's the pathophysiology of the disease? Mm -hmm. What's the usual non-apheresis treatment? What's the evidence supporting the use of apheresis? And then the technical aspects of the individual apheresis procedures. And then a list of the references that were used to come up with that fact sheet. Mm -hmm. They are all organized in alphabetical order based on the disease mm -hmm. name in the Journal of Clinical Apheresis in one document. Now, the other thing that's important is the ASFA category and the ASFA recommendation grade, okay? Yes. So the ASFA categories are categories one through four. Mm -hmm. okay? um, so a category one indication for an apheresis procedure is that apheresis is a primary treatment modality, either standalone or in conjunction with something else. So what I tell my residents, what I tell people is this is the word association game, okay? If I say a word and you tell me the first word that pops into your mind, that's what a category one is. So when I say thrombotic thrombocytopenic purpura, you should mm -hmm. immediately think plasma exchange. Yep. That's an example of a category one. Okay? Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, category two, the apheresis treatment is a second line therapy, either standalone or conjunction with other therapies. So here, you do something else first, okay? Mm -hmm. And if that fails, then you consider the apheresis treatment. So, what's an example? An example, I'll give two. Uh, from a plasma exchange perspective, um, uh, acute central nervous system demyelination. So, somebody's walking along, talking, everything's great, suddenly, boom, they have demyelination of their central nervous system due to multiple sclerosis or due to neuromyelitis optica. Mm -hmm. The first line therapy is high dose intravenous steroids. If they fail to respond to that, there are randomized controlled trials that show that a percent roughly 60%, will respond to plasma exchange. So if they fail a usual course of steroids, you try plasma exchange on them. Another example would be babesiosis. In mm -hmm. somebody who is not symptomatic from it, but they're at risk for becoming symptomatic. Let's say they had their spleen removed for some reason, mm -hmm. right? I can do a red cell exchange and get rid of those parasites. Mm -hmm. But first they should be treated with appropriate antibiotic therapy in an attempt to control the parasitemia. If they okay. fail to respond, you can do plasma or do red cell exchange, okay? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's category two, second line okay, therapy. Okay, so just, just for summary, category one, primary first line therapy, either by itself or with something else. Category two, second line therapy, again, either by itself or with something else, correct? Yes, but you do that other treatment first. Right, got it. Okay. okay. Now, okay. category three. Mm-hmm. Category three is the role for apheresis is uncertain, and the treatment needs to be individualized. Now, this doesn't mean that the, the apheresis treatment is experimental. It doesn't mean that the apheresis treatment doesn't work, and it doesn't mean that the apheresis treatment, uh, that there's no evidence supporting it. What it means is this, that there may be a disease entity, all right, and there's a subset of patients with that disease where the apheresis treatment is appropriate. Okay? Okay. So not everybody with the disease. Okay? Mm -hmm. So an example. I think examples are always good. Let's yep. say we got somebody with uh, ankyovasculitis, so anti-neutrophil cytoplasmic antibody vasculitis, right? Mm -hmm. Wegener's, polyangiitis, things of that nature, right? If they come in and they have ankyovasculitis and they are not dialysis dependent at presentation. The literature suggests that plasma exchange doesn't do too much for them, okay? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So you really wouldn't look to do plasma exchange. You'd treat them with immunosuppressants, right? But let's say that this patient comes in. They have ankyovasculitis. They're not dialysis dependent at this moment in time. But let's say they have a long-standing history of poorly controlled diabetes, a long-standing history of poorly controlled hypertension. Their kidneys may not have enough glomeruli mm -hmm. to tolerate the immune complex deposition, right? Mm -hmm. Because mm -hmm. they've had all this damage from their diabetes and their hypertension. So you might look at that patient and say, you know, I don't think they have much renal reserve. I am actually going to do plasma exchange in this patient because of these individual patient characteristics. Okay? Okay. 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 So another, just another example might be, um, you know, somebody comes in and they have Wilson's disease. We don't do mm -hmm. plasma exchange for people with Wilson's disease. They get chelation therapy. Mm -hmm. But some people with Wilson's disease have massive intravascular hemolysis due to release of the copper from uh, 
let's say, ischemia from their liver because they enter in a catabolic state, right? Mm -hmm. In doing that, you can do the plasma exchange. It removes the red cell fragments from the hemolysis, but it also removes the copper that's causing the hemolysis. So once again, you don't treat everybody with Wilson's disease with plasma exchange. Mm -hmm. But that subset of patients that has that severe intervascular hemolysis, you might treat them. Got it. Got it. Okay. okay. So that's category three. Fours. Don't ask me to do fours, okay? <laughs> <laughs> Those are the ones where I look at you and say, no. Okay. Yeah. So a category four indication is an indication for which apheresis has been found, whatever the treatment is, has been found to be either harmful or ineffective. Okay. Now, my favorite example, everybody always laughs, schizophrenia. Uh-huh. There was actually a randomized controlled trial in 1979 where they randomized schizophrenics, okay, to plasma exchange, either real plasma exchange or a sham procedure. Guess what? It didn't work, okay? Mm -hmm. So don't ask me to do plasma exchange for schizophrenia. Uh, and there are other disorders that are a little less um, um, obvious than that that are Category 4 indications. Uh, for example, um, uh, the, the renal injuries that occur in the setting of uh, sy the, the chronic renal injuries that occur in the setting of systemic lupus erythematosus. Uh, they've been shown that uh, plasma exchange does not affect the progression of those entities. Okay. Uh, and therefore, it's a Category 4 indication to do plasma exchange for the chronic renal injury and insult in lupus. Okay, so practically speaking, Jeff, you've got these four categories, and I know there are there are other things that you evaluate in terms of in terms of the the quality of the uh, the, the research that involved in the recommendations. So we'll get to that in just a second. But how do you, how do you use these practically speaking on your service yeah. when someone asks you for a, a procedure? Hey, category one and category two are pretty straightforward. Category one, mm -hmm. they call me, I'm going to do it. I'm going to go to the ASFA guidelines. I'm going to look at what is in the ASFA guidelines because that's based on what's in the medical literature. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to follow those. Okay. For the category twos, I'm going to ask the question, Hey, did you do the other treatment? <laughs> and if yeah. they didn't do the other treatment, then the question is, why didn't you do the other treatment? <laughs> right? <laughs> now, sometimes it might be, well, you know, hey, and I've had this happen to me. This patient has, you know, CMV retinitis. And if I give them a high dose of immunosuppressive therapy, which is the first line therapy, they're going to go blind. Mm -hmm. Okay. You yeah. didn't do the treatment. So, yeah, I'm going to go ahead and do it. Right? I, I may right. go ahead and do the plasma exchange. But, but I'm going to ask them, why haven't we done the other therapy? Uh, if there's a risk, if there's a contraindication, then we'll proceed. Okay. Got it. Uh, for the category threes, uh, those are a little complex. Let's do the category fours. Pretty straightforward. Unless it's on a, a, an IRB-approved protocol that's looking at the use of apheresis and the treatment of whatever mm -hmm. that category four indication. To be honest with you, my answer is no, mm -hmm. because the okay. literature says this is ineffective. Unless, and we'll talk in a moment about the recommendation grades, unless the literature that has, that has generated the Category 4 uh, categorization is so very poor. It's, let's say it's just all a small number of case series or case reports where things didn't work, right? Mm -hmm. Then I may, if they can make a, a rational argument, uh, hmm. I may try an empiric course, but with defined endpoints, right? Not just the let's keep on going because it might work sort of thing. Got it. Got it. Um, the threes, they end up being a little bit more complex because we're going to need to evaluate that individual patient. We're going to need to use our medical judgment, mm -hmm. not only the medical judgment of the clinician, but, you know, hey, it's my responsibility. The buck stops with me when it comes to the plasma exchange or whatever the procedure is. So it's going to be my medical judgment, too. So there's a lot of um, discussion, negotiation, um, <laughs> a consultation, to be honest with you, with the clinician. I, I really want them to come up with a, a rational argument, not the when in doubt, for reset out, not the <laughs> remove the evil humor sort of discussion. Got it. Okay. So Jeff, I, I, I made you, I made you uh, get off track for just a second, but let's talk about those recommendation yeah. grades because those go along with the categories, right? Right. Um, and so what the recommendation grades are is based on the grade system, okay? And what it is is there's either a one or a two. A one is a strong recommendation, a two is a weak recommendation. And mm -hmm. then there's a letter, A, B, or C. A is high quality evidence, B is moderate quality evidence, and C is low quality. So a, randomized controlled trials, B, mm -hmm. controlled trials, but not randomized, or flawed randomized trials, mm -hmm. and C, 
case series, case reports, Dr. Winter's expert opinion, okay? <laughs> so low quality evidence, okay? Um, and so it's giving you a sense of what is the evidence that supports it, okay? Um, mm -hmm. And you can use that in the context of the ASFA recommendation, of the uh, ASFA categories, to sort of, again, figure out the, the, the strength of things. Now, one thing I do want to point out is this. For those Category 4s, you mm -hmm. can see a 1A recommendation grade, and sometimes people freak out about that. Mm -hmm. But that's a strong recommendation not, not. to do the procedure Got based it. on high-quality evidence. So if Got you it. have, let's say, a 2C Category mm -hmm. 4... That tells you it's a weak recommendation not to do it based on really I low see. quality evidence. So that would be the one where you might say, hmm, I need mm. to look at the literature. I need to mm -hmm. see if maybe something's changed. Maybe I might consider a trial. I got it. You know, I got it. it. So, so in a sense, the, the, the recommendation grades tell you how strong the recommendation is to put that disease in that category? Yes. Is that a fair way to put it? Okay. Yep, yep, yep. Okay, okay. good deal. All right, so... Uh, Jeff, I want to I want to make sure before we hit TTP, mm -hmm. uh, one of the things that that I get, uh, I think that there's a decent amount of misunderstanding out there with in not only among transfusion medicine folks, including people in in blood banks, but also among clinicians, is that I think there's a basic misunderstanding or at least lack of understanding of how plasma exchange works. So we're going to talk move into specifically plasma yes, exchange, sir. and and I think there's a little bit of a misconception out there that hey, it's this this magic this magic machine that'll just you know you put people on the machine and by God it's taken out so much of this stuff and you know I I've had many conversations with people saying when I tell them for example, that we're going to do one and a half times the plasma volume. And they'll say, well, why don't you just go farther? Because my God, we want to get it all out. So take us through that real quickly, yeah. Jeff, in terms of the pathophysiology of how it works. I refer to it as the cookie principle. <laughs> okay. Okay. I didn't, I didn't ask you this, Joe. Do you have kids? I do. Two of them. Two of them. Uh, and, and how old are they? Uh, 24 and 21. Uh, so, so you went through the two-year-old stage, right? <laughs> In right? the dim recesses of my memory, yeah. yes. <laughs> same here. You know, mine are the same age as yours. Um, so, you know, two-year-olds, right? If one cookie is good, two cookies are twice as good, three right. cookies are three times as good, four cookies are four times as good, right? The cookie principle. You yeah, you know, yeah. hey, if one plasma volume is good, then two must be twice as good and ten must be ten times, right? Yep. Not the way it works. Okay. Mm. So the removal of a substance from the intervascular space is defined by actually an exponential equation, meaning that we never get to zero. Why don't we get to zero? Well, we're not hanging people by their heels from the ceiling, draining all of their blood out into a big bucket, separating it and putting it back, okay? What we're doing is blood's coming out into the machine and from one arm and going back in the machine from the other arm, right. and we're doing uh, a replacement fluid, which mm -hmm. means that we are that, 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 that evil humor, whatever it is that we're removing, is getting diluted by our replacement fluid. Got it. Okay. Right? So mm -hmm. that's why it's an exponential equation. So when you do a one to one and a half plasma volume exchange, you mm -hmm. remove 65 to 70% of whatever is in the plasma. That's the evil stuff and the mm -hmm. good stuff. Okay? Mm -hmm. It's 60, 65 to 70%. All those people that are residents, remember that for board exams. Okay? Ah, uh, yes, for yeah. sure. Okay. So, um, so you're removing that, right? Um, now, whoa, hey, great. I removed 65 to 70%. Great. Let's do another plasma volume, shall we? Uh -huh. Sure. Uh -huh. You're going to actually remove, again, 65 to 70% of whatever's in the intervascular space. But the absolute amount is much less because you've already removed 65 to 70% of what was there, right? Yep. So the percent stays the same with each plasma volume, but the absolute amount is smaller and mm -hmm. smaller and smaller and smaller and never goes to zero. So once you really get beyond one to one and a half plasma volumes, mm -hmm. you are not removing, you're still removing 65 to 70% of what's there, but the absolute amount is becoming insignificant, infinitesimal. All Got you're it. really doing is prolonging the procedure, Mm -hmm. exposing the patient to more replacement fluid, exposing the patient to uh, more anticoagulant. So what are you doing? Greater risk without greater benefit. Okay. Diminishing returns. So the standard of practice, and I'm using the term standard of practice from the medical legal malpractice standpoint. The mm -hmm. standard of practice is one to one and a half plasma volumes when we talk about plasma exchanges. 
okay. if you're exceeding that, you are outside the standard of practice, and there's a danger if the patient has a complication. Mm-hmm. And, and I think something that you just said there, I want to make sure that, that everyone catches this. You, you, you talked about this earlier, and you, you just mentioned it again, that that removal, and you, you were very clear on what you were saying. You're removing all the stuff. It's yep. not a selective process. So you're, you're, not only are you taking out the bad thing that you're targeting, whatever that might be, but you're getting a lot of the other stuff too, right? Oh, yeah. I get a lot of grief from uh, the doctors of pharmacy, the PharmDs here at Mayo. Why? Uh-huh. I get these patients that are coming for a plasma exchange and they're on intravenous antibiotics. And you know what the first thing my <laughs> nurses do when they hit the floor? They turn off their IV antibiotics. And the PharmD's <laughs> like, ah, you can't do that. Well, you know, Folks, if the medication was running in while I'm doing the plasma exchange, it's not mm-hmm. in the patient. Yep. It's in the waste bag, right? Right. So we stop the IVs. We mm-hmm. stop the medications. In fact, if you have a once-a-day medication that you're giving somebody, please give it after the plasma oh. exchange, right? Because oh, otherwise, preach it. If, if, <laughs> if, if you can't give it afterwards, right, you can't give it afterwards, then you probably want to give it at least four hours prior to the plasma exchange to allow for redistribution so it's outside the intravascular space. And that's assuming that it's a drug that is not highly protein bound with a small volume of distribution. Those sorts of drugs are going to be limited to the intravascular space, really effective, really efficient at removing those. Um, Really efficient. Okay. So uh, let, let us talk a little bit about something else that you mentioned, and that's replacement fluids. So going along with that, the Mm -hmm. fact that we're taking out stuff that maybe we don't we would rather not have taken out. How does that influence your decision on what you're going to give back yeah. to the patient? So the usual replacement fluid, okay, is going to be uh, albumin. Why? You know, I've had clinicians say, hey, you're removing plasma. I want you to give plasma back. Well, you know, we all see these reactions to transfusions, right? Mm-hmm. We see allergic reactions. We see anaphylactic reactions. We see transfusion-related acute lung injury. Yeah, I've had apheresis patients that have had trolley, right? So. Mm-hmm. Albumin as a replacement fluid has a lower side effect profile than using plasma as the replacement fluid, okay? Now, mm-hmm. you might say, well, wait a minute. Albumin's awfully expensive. The term mm-hmm. that they use in Minnesota is called spendy, by the way, okay? Uh, um, spendy, got it. Spendy. Um, <laughs> so let's use something else, shall we? Let's use uh, saline, okay? Hey, let's replace with saline. Well, the problem with saline is you have that redistribution, right? Sure. So it moves out of the intervascular space. So at the end of your procedure, your patient is hypovolemic, and they're going to have unacceptable risk of hypotensive reactions. So the mm-hmm. standard replacement is 70% albumin, 30% saline. You're given the 30% saline to be honest with you, you're cutting your albumin, so it's saline's cheaper. That's what mm-hmm. you And the way you do this, folks, trust me, I see people that don't do it this way and they regret it. Mm-hmm. You give that saline at the beginning of the procedure and you give that colloid, the albumin, at the end of the procedure. If you give the saline at the end of the procedure, folks, you're going to have the fluid shifting and hypovolemia, okay? Got it. And Got it. bad things are going to happen. So what okay. we do here is we hang a 500 ml bag of saline as the first part of my replacement fluid. All that mm-hmm. saline ends up in the waste bag and mm-hmm. then albumin for the rest of it. Uh, I know some people that will alternate. They'll do uh, saline, then some albumin, then some saline, and then albumin for the final portion. Now, okay. if there's something that we need to replace, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm, like a coag factor, mm-hmm. uh, because we're concerned that our patient is going to go get cut on by the surgeons after our plasma exchange. Or maybe when we talk about TTP, we're replacing Adam's TS-13, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, Then we're going to use plasma as our replacement fluid. And we'll either use 100% plasma, like when we treat TTP, or we might just limit it to plasma at the end to replace those coag factors Mm -hmm. uh, that we need. Uh, But really, using plasma is is pretty narrow. Uh, It's TTP. Hemolytic mm-hmm. uremic syndrome, or what's now being referred to as uh, complement-mediated uh, 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 microangiopathy, mm-hmm. um, and then to replace coagulation factors when somebody is either bleeding or they will be hemostatically challenged and potentially bleed. Got it. So how do you how do you respond to those docs who who are so concerned about the coag factors when you're replacing with albumin? What's the is, is there a general estimate of of what proportion of the coag factors you lose from a say from a one volume plasma exchange? Yeah, you're gonna you, if basically the way it works out is if I do uh, albumin straight mm-hmm. uh, if I do albumin as my replacement fluid. Uh, you know, I'm going to remove 70% of the coag factors, mm-hmm. uh, with the exception of fibrinogen. I actually remove a little bit more because it coats the plastic. Now, the factors eight and nine, 
-hmm. they're going to actually come back to normal levels within two to four hours after the completion of the plasma exchange, okay? okay. Everything else except for fibrinogen, fibrinogen is going to come back to normal levels within 24 hours. Okay. And then fibrinogen is going to be the laggard, and it's going to be about 66% of the preapheresis values at 72 hours. Now, remember, fibrinogen is an acute phase reactant, so it can start off pretty high. You still mm. might, after the plasma exchange, have adequate levels there, but it's a little difficult. So some okay. people will measure fibrinogen at the end of the procedure and give cryoprecipitate if needed. Uh, some people will uh, routinely measure it and just say, hey, I'm not going to do the plasma exchange tomorrow. I'm going to skip a day. Mm -hmm. uh, what I tend to do, and there's much variation practice, if I know somebody's bleeding or going to be challenged, I usually end up giving them uh, three units of FFP. If they're a real big person, maybe four units as the final portion of my replacement. Got it. Uh, variation in practice, uh, I'll tell people, you know, decide what you feel most comfortable with, whether it's measuring things, delaying things, or uh, just giving something at the end. Hey everyone, it's Joe with just a couple of closing thoughts. As I'm sure you noticed, we did not include the last bit of this conversation in this particular episode. And the last bit of this conversation that we talked about during it was the use of therapeutic apheresis, in particular plasma exchange, in the treatment of thrombotic thrombocytopenic purpura. So TTP is something that's super important. So I didn't want to just tag it onto the end of this episode. And so Blood Bank Guy Essentials episode 26 will be that discussion with Dr. Winters on the use of plasma exchange in TTP. I think you'll be, it'll be worth it to come back and check it out. I hope you really enjoyed this particular episode. There was a lot of information here. And again, that's, that's why I didn't just want to cram in uh, the TTP stuff at the end. I think it's, it'll be useful for it to have its own episode. So thank you very much for listening. I'd like to remind you, if you're listening to this podcast in front of your computer, uh, or if you're listening to it on the go the next time you're in front of your computer, please go to iTunes and, and hit us up with a subscription and a rating. That really does make a big difference for getting the podcast in front of more people. And, and really, that's the whole goal here. I'm trying to just teach basic blood banking, teach the essentials to as many people as possible. And thank you for being a part of that. I have really enjoyed hanging out with you for episode 25 of the Blood Bank Guy Essentials podcast. I hope that you come back and see us next time. And until then, as you go through your day, I hope that you'll smile. I hope that you'll have fun. And above all, never, ever stop learning. Thanks a lot. We'll catch you next time on the podcast. 